How are you doing? Hey, Roberto. I'm doing very well uh, under the circumstances. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fantastic and nice to see you. Uh, see you. So we have had a chance to work together many years ago. Yes. I, fo I follow your work also. So it would be wonderful if you would share with us all uh, who you are, what, you're do what you do, maybe even what you have done up to uh, this moment or up to the moment in which you got stuck at home yes. or uh, COVID has arrived and then we'll take it from there. Okay? Sure. Uh, my name is Corey Allen uh, and I am by training an actor. Um, but I think of myself as a you know, multi-hyphenate artist. Um, I write, I play photography, multimedia, um, little filmmaking on the side, uh, done some directing, I like to move. And uh, I think the older I get, the more I realize that um, the role of the artist, the storyteller is to tell the story where it is find the story where it is and to listen to whichever of the muses is talking to you in this particular moment. So um, I trained as an actor, undergrad and graduate degree, um, moved in a, and have been based in New York City for almost 20 years and um, have worked there on the stage, uh, on the screen, uh, a lot of voiceover work. Um, particular interest in the classics. I've always been drawn to those epic, ancient, timeless stories about the big themes of, um, of our existence and what it means to be a human being on this rolling rock. Um, in the last couple of months, I took a pretty sharp left turn, uh, stepped away from my acting career to be a guest uh, faculty member at the university here in Austin, Texas. So I was kind of in the middle of that transition period, going from creating work to being more of a mentor and uh, an encourager and uh, an educator for the next generation of artists. When this surprise from uh, COVID-19 hit us. So I'm here in Austin, I had uh, planned we were just about at spring break in the semester here at UT. I had planned to go to, well, actually I'll tell you the real, the real deal. Initially, I had wanted to go to Japan. This is like, I've been wanting to go to Japan for a very, 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 very long time. And so when I made the decision to come teach her for the semester, um, one of the big perks of it, um, which was you know, sold to me by my boss was, you know, we get a spring break, it's a week, and you, know, you can build that time and go do whatever you want. So, I was anticipating going to Japan for spring break. And I hadn't purchased the ticket, but in mid-January, when the news came out about the cruise ship there, uh, I said, maybe I shouldn't go. And a couple of friends who we were talking about maybe going together said, you know what? The tickets are good. Let's go to Italy. And so I began to look at, I began to look at tickets online for Italy. And believe it or not, then the news began to come out about what was happening in Italy. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to Japan. I'm not going to Italy. I should probably just go home to New York and I'll use the week to, reju you know, to rejuvenate. And then all of a sudden, it began to happen in New York. So I made the decision. Um, I had a ticket to fly on the 12th of March. Um, I'm sorry, for the 13th of March. But on the 12th of March, I made the decision not to go. And I think that was right when they began to lock down the city. The number of infections was shooting up. They had no idea how the curve was going to, um, what was going to happen. So I decided to hunker down here in Austin. And I've been here since. Um, I haven't left the city. And we're now in, I guess, month two or something like that. I mean, it's now May, May 12th or 13th. So yeah, it's been just about two months. Um, and so, yeah, that's, this is where I've been. Uh, I had rented a house here in East Austin, not far from the lake, um, a place with lots of character, um, lots of birds, as you can probably hear, um, a very different kind of existence from what I was used to in my apartment in, uh, in Brooklyn. 
So you are doubly isolated because first you're not in the city where you have all your friends, your connections. So I know you, you, I'm sure you made great friends also in Austin, but still you are in Austin locked in your house. So kind of a double whammy there. How, how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, I will say because we moved uh, most of the, all of the teaching to online, this virtual space, I was forced to be sort of preoccupied with my work for, you know, most of the rest of that semester. But we just wrapped that up about a week ago. And I'm now beginning to feel the effects of, I'm in a place that is not my home. I mean, there's a bed and couches and, you know, dishes and things like that. But there's nothing like the creature comforts of home. And you're right, there are, I have some professional connections and a few friends here in the city, but because everyone is sheltering in place, you know, if you're not immediate family, you're not, you know, you're on your own. So it has been a very, um, it's been a very peculiar experience. Um, obviously we count ourselves as a first world country. And so, you know, I have been able to go to the grocery store and go to get coffee, but this sort of plague isolation thing and the effect that uh, um, not knowing who's infected and who is not infected, the way that that, in, that that informs the way that even strangers interact with you on the street has been very peculiar. And I think as an artist um, who is sort of sensitive to that kind of energy, it's been very, very interesting to sort of see how we're navigating through space in this time. You know, who is friend, who is foe, who is infected, who is safe, um, I haven't drawn any real conclusions about it, but I've definitely noted it. Let's, let's actually go a little bit deeper, deeper and let's articulate a little bit more about this narrative of uh, this uh, new reality in which you find yourself in Austin, away from home, uh, sheltering place like everybody else. And now you start going out and looking at people um so as an artist as you you of course you're gonna look at that this as an artist also right or not or is it, are you you're just trying to digest it i mean what i'm asking is uh, in this moment where does corey person and and corey artist begins or maybe there is no this distinction and it's like all is the same. Could you um, articulate that? Because it's very important to us. Um, Absolutely. That's, I mean, I think uh, for myself, um, I, I cannot separate my artist brain from my life brain, you know. Uh, some, you know, I'm sure a shrink with a much higher pay grade than I could probably <laughs> explain why, what that's about. But I couldn't help but begin to make connections about isolation and what that's supposed to do to the artist, at least what I understand it has done for artists historically. You know, you look at some of the great painters to some of the great composers who, you know, and some of the great writers who in times of plague, in times of war, in times of um, devastation, we're still able to sort of create. So I definitely think I, I have felt that kind of, for lack of a better word, responsibility, whether or not I have felt um, any sort of ability to act on that thing. Um, it doesn't escape me, you know, that I found myself in this situation with all of the sort of creature comforts of home, not at my disposal none of the sort of, uh, you know, the, the human connections that I would normally have run to and sort of sought sucker or, or, or comfort from were, were there. And um, there were many a day here where I, I thought, well, like I should be writing something now. This is the moment that I should be writing something or this is the moment that I should be shooting something. And although I have not taken out my camera since I've been in, in, uh, in town, I have been working sort of in a multimedia space um, I've, I used to use Instagram for a while as a way of, you know, exploring um, images, sounds, things that seem to not make sense. There is a part of this whole experience which, 
to say it's surreal is an understatement, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel logical. There, you know, there's food in the store, but you can't really get in to get it, you know, uh, like, because there, you know, there are people all around. Um, all the restaurants are stocked and ready to go, but they can't have people in them because it's a risk. So you're walking by, you're seeing people, I think, attempting to the best of their ability to go about life as normal not knowing what the next normal is going to be. And I think the artist's job is um, to steal from the great James Baldwin, to disrupt the peace. It's our, it's our job to sort of forge forward and to figure out what this new normal is going to be. Um, I think usually we have the, the, the benefit of being able to sort of gather and commiserate and collaborate. But this particular um, pandemic, this problem, has got us all kind of on our own. So it's, it's nice that we're able to use this technology as a way to reconnect. So uh, speaking of photography, one of the ways I, I follow you is through Instagram. Mm -hmm. And you have a very specific, um, very, uh, you're posting your pictures, your images. Uh, I always know that's you, even before the label, right? Because there is a very specific um, aesthetic to it, you know, an angle to, to it. So, has it changed since the arrival of uh, COVID-19? So what are you posting? You know, I actually, uh, I paused my, my um, most active Instagram account um, when I got to I think it was 6116 images I froze that account and I actually began another one um, so can I ask you when, when did you do that uh, the date of that I can tell you um, was it was on April 21st. Oh, that's what, because I couldn't find much of a, a, a yeah. There's a good reason why I'm asking that question because I did not see that much there. So, okay, please. Uh, April 21st, you know what, and I will say what's interesting about Instagram, uh, and I have many issues with it, not to mention, you know, least of all because it's now owned by <laughs> Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, as I've traveled around for work, I, I always find myself, um, you know, drawn to a particular motif or a type of architecture or uh, something that becomes the motif of the theme of that moment. And leaving Brooklyn, New York and coming to Austin, um, I had to register that it was a, there was a cultural shift. There was a, there was a completely different vibe here. And I had been told that by, you know, people before I came, they said, you know, it's a liberal bastion and it's, you know, fun town and there'll be South by Southwest. And so I came here expecting to sort of experience what that was going to be. And then there was a pause. So I don't think the Austin that I'm experiencing necessarily is, you know, what Austin would normally be. But um, I think in the isolation and finding a new routine, um, the things that I was coming into contact with were not the same as they were before. Um, up until us sheltering in place, I could go to bars, I could go to restaurants, I was going to art museums. I was allowing that stimuli to sort of inform uh, my eye, so to speak. And I think in the absence of that external stimuli, I didn't feel like the things that I was posting connected to that that voice. And so I created another, I've created another uh, persona, for lack of a better word, um, that is looking at a lot more stark um, subject matter. Everything is devoid of color. Everything is sort of black, white. Um, some things are in focus, some things are not in focus. I do feel very much um, out of focus right now, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. So, <clears throat> in the middle of, uh, of uh, uh, your shelter in place, you have decided to switch accounts. 
to close one and start a new one. But that's a, a major, in my opinion, that's a major thing. Is the artist reacting to something quite uh, important? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't think that I'm following you on this new account, so I will look for it um, because I haven't seen it. Um, so this is quite interesting, this, um, this, this need, which happened a month, a little bit more than a month after you were shot, uh, locked in, the, in, the, in town, in the house, and uh, about three, four weeks ago. Quite interesting. Yeah. Well, the house, I mean, the, the house is its own story. I could, you know, tell you. I'm sure I'll take some pictures of it. Um, it's so drastically different than my, my home in New York. And I don't think that I allowed myself when I signed the lease to, to, to even consider how the environment would inform me. Um, I live in a very comfortable apartment in New York City, you know, great views of the skyline, um, lots of amenities. Um, and this house, is a, it's, it's a very, it's been a very humbling experience. I mean, it has all the things that you need, but um, one of the quirky aspects of it, because it's a very old house, I think built probably in the 1920s, none of the floors even, every single point in the house, like is at a different level. So you're never, you're never, you can, I mean, if someone is in the house with you, you're never eye to eye. And so it is sort of affected my, my perspective um old sinks very hard water um floors that creak animal i mean it's a very it's a for a city boy like myself uh it's like being thrown into uh back into nature into the country somehow even though this is a a, a big city um and i can imagine you know italy versus texas it must be they must be two completely different worlds right oh yeah absolutely yeah it's uh, two different realities but not just uh, texas and uh, rome or italy but america and italy they are completely different realities uh, geographically and you know culturally uh, if i think about for a moment and realize yeah well there are many differences there yeah and that's the beauty of it uh this uh embrace now I'm I'm more used to go back and forth, so I at times I don't notice those ch changes. So, in your opinion, what what are you seeing in the in the Austin in terms of uh, how the government, whether it is the local government, the regional one, and the national government, is responding to this uh, emergency? There's been a lot of confusion. Um, it seems to me that the mayor of this city, um, who has made, I think, some of the smarter and more controversial decisions, like canceling South by Southwest, um, even before there was a clear picture of how bad this infection was going to get, um, actively supporting the sheltering in place, all of that, and, and telling non-essential businesses to shut down. I feel like that voice early on in the process was, was loudest. And I think there were, there were people that I would hear in bars, um, some of the Airbnb owners who were, um, you know, devastated by the decision to cancel South by Southwest and thought that it was kind of overblown, but they were hoping that it would be, um, hoping that it was a smart decision. And I think now that we've seen what happened in New York, the death toll out of there, if you had had that many, many people descend on Austin, this would be, I think the story would be uh, drastically different than it is. But I think the governor and the lieutenant governor of the states have had a completely different point of view where it's clear, I, I don't know how important, um, the loss of life is to them or the possible the possibility of, of greater infections is to them but it, it is clear to me that the economy of the state is the priority their priority so i've seen some business owners um 
in the neighborhood who, while we were sheltering in place, were doing their best to, you know, provide hand sanitizer and enforce distancing. But they've lacked, those, those things have been loosened up significantly over the last week or two. And I think that they just want to make money again. And so that, at least in the neighborhood that I've been living in, and the people that I've come into contact with, um, the cash is king. The cash is king. And uh, people want to open the economy back up. I've seen people very laxed when it comes to uh, social distancing and mask wearing. Um, it seems, again, I'm not from Texas. I'm not a Texan. So I feel bad kind of commenting on it. But it feels to me like the, the, the persona of this area is, you know, let me do my thing. I know that they're don't tread on me motif. I mean, it, it's very, it's very much um, in the air here. And I think that that is informed greatly by the people who lead the, lead the state and lead the city. I think that the mayor has had to do a real delicate dance, like trying to protect people. I know since I worked at the university, his priority has been, you know, uh, they've been protecting students and protecting the locals. But if the governor wants to open the state, the governor wants to open the state, you know? And I think all of us are sort of stuck in between those two extremes um, with no real input on which is the better option. So how do you feel about being stuck in the middle? Well, it's aggravating. It's certainly aggravating. Um, I feel that uh, personal responsibility is important. I think, you know, only you can be, um, you, you are going to be your, the best advocate for your own safety and your own health, of course. But we don't live in a vacuum. So I know if I'm walking somewhere and it's possible that I could be asymptomatic and that I could cause harm to someone, that it's in everyone's best interest for me to sort of safeguard that, you know? Like, I have no problem wearing a mask. I have no problem uh, staying six feet or eight feet away from someone. Uh, I have no problem if I'm walking down a street and there's someone coming the other direction and they're not, you know, masked. That I, I mean, I, I can cross the street. But I don't think that that is something that everybody believes. And so, it becomes exhausting to sort of have to maneuver around this space where you don't really know uh, who is friend, who is foe. Uh, I had an instance at a, a coffee shop a couple of days ago where I'm masked and gloved and everyone who's working there is masked and gloved. And three drunk guys pull up, I guess they had an Uber, they pulled up uh, in an Uber, um, got out, came up behind me. They were, you know, probably a foot away from me. They're talking to the, you know, the, uh, the employees from the coffee shop who were just like, hey, you can't be here without a mask or, and these guys were oblivious to them. And they were drunk and so they were a little belligerent. So I got my, you know, my coffee and I left. But um, I don't know how you navigate that. And we're seeing stories from around the country of um, well-intentioned employees trying to tell people, put on a mask or step back. And suddenly, uh, the resentment of being told what to do or, you know, feeling that, you know, the rules don't apply to them is bringing out in some of these places, you know, these sort of tensions, which are interesting to observe as the artist because we know, we know where they come from, right? It's fear or it's a desire to control, you know? And I think so many of us as creatives have just been used to so long having to just give up control, right? You know, that we have no control and that we have to work within that system that uh, I think we're more, we're more prepared to, uh, to embrace that than some civilians, as I would call them. So, but how are we prepared to look, to observe scenes of people with guns? Um, in front of governmental buildings, or even going to buy a coffee with just these huge crowds. How do we feel about that? And what shall we not? Well, we always can do something through our arts, but this is, this is happening. This is happening. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I, I, 
I could talk for hours about, you know, the complacency of the American artist um, in the 21st century. I think we have so many, so many luxuries, right? And we have so many escapes, you know, that you don't necessarily have to pay a high price to be an artist. There were people who came before us who it cost them something. It really cost them something to put their name on the line and to say, I am an artist, I create, I'm going to tell this truth, I'm gonna show this truth. Um, I think we've lost a lot of that, quite frankly. I mean, I just don't think it's, it's, it's cultural. You know, we, I can rail against the internet for, for forever, but it's helping us, it's allowing us to talk, so I can't rail too much, you know, it is serving a, a function. But um, the role that the artist plays in fighting for change and fighting for um, uh, the rights of people, fighting for humanity's chance, I, I, think, I think we've gotten very complacent. And I understand, you know, when you're bombarded with a lot of information and you, there's no real sense that there's anything that you could do that would make a difference, of course, you know, you sit on the couch and you watch Netflix or you, you know, bake some sourdough bread or you, you know, <laughs> drink, you know, have a martini hour with your friends on Zoom. Um, but I think there is more demand of us. And I do think, you know, I, I feel fortunate to have spent the last, you know, these last couple of months in the university teaching the next generation of, you know, of actors because I look at them and I see their wide eyes and I realize if we don't, as the people who've been doing this thing and telling this story till they come, on, till they come onto the scene, if we don't hand those traditions to them, if we don't prepare them to be able to scale the castle when necessary, they won't be able to do it. They won't be able to do it, you know? And I'm, the thing that concerns me most about this particular virus is that, you know, it's decimating these older populations. And many of these people, I don't, you know, the numbers are so huge, we can't even really tally it, experience it. I'm sure there are going to be brain trusts that have been lost, you know, artists and practitioners who had lots, lots more knowledge to share and, and gifts to impart that will just, that connection is gone, you know. Um, and we should be advocating for that. Know, as artists. Hmm. Well, one of the theories that I have developed through my conversation with artists is this, and I'll share it with you, is that in this moment, um, is a moment of crisis. I was listening to Eugenio Barba giving a lecture. Eugenio Barba is um, one of um, the last masters of theaters left. Uh, worked with Grotowski is from Odin Theater. And he was talking about uh, the, the journey of the Odin Theater in, uh, in uh, the Denmark. He was talking about all the crises that he imposed to the theater in order for the theater to keep growing. Now, up to a point of dismantling the theater, up to the point of sending some of the actors away. You know, and he said in his story, of the evolution of um, who Eugenio Barba is and the Odin Theater is, he was talking about that uh, one of the messages for me that I got is that every, after every crisis, there is this, uh, um, you find new ways of uh, looking at uh, your art, yeah. and, uh, ways that you didn't think about, and that your art is going to gain out of this. Which is also true. In every, in every story, there is always a, cri a crisis, even in the Hollywood movies, right? There is a crisis, and then out of the crisis, something new happens, right? A new way. Yeah. And we do have to embrace this crisis. And I was thinking, for me, that I am pretty, I've become pretty militant in my, in my thinking, is that now the role of the artist is uh, twofold. One is that of recording reality as it is because we have to record what's happening, because we have a short memory. We forget. We forget the, the specific moments of our lives that are inf that informed how we felt, 
right? Uh, and so to record recording these memories so that the recording documenting what's happening so that after they will become memories and story that have to be told. That's one part. The second part is that of uh, obviously the system has uh, failed us. When I talk about the system is the neoliberal system where God, the God, the dollar, as you mentioned, no? Uh, before the money is uh, fi the finances, the money, the economy is at the center, right? Uh, this is uh, obviously has failed us and um, has started to destroy some of our, uh, what we believe, what we counted on, right? And for now, I think that the artists in this moment should finish destroying what needs to be destroyed completely is drawing it through our art. I'm not saying that, I'm not talking about going with guns. When I'm talking about destruction is write and, 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 uh, and perform and, and paint our reality and what has been destroying us and, put, and then with the objective of putting something else at the center of, the uni of this universe. The new, this new, I don't like the word new normal because I don't like norm, the, the repetition of normal, right? We want to go back to the old ways. That's what they are forcing us to do. But we don't want to go back there. We cannot go back where what uh, failed us. So it was wonderful to hear you mention something that I've been thinking for some time, that now it's our role of taking charge of this... Uh, um, this uh, moment, finish destroying what has to be destroyed. Harold Klurman, whom I know you know, used to say that there is a lot of manure in theater, uh, lots of bad theater, right? But yes, the manure would uh, would fertilize the ground, and out of this manure, something beautiful would grow, right? In this yeah. way of talking about theater with so much emo emotional engagement. I think that now is our goal, taking these new generations and, be, and bringing them through as a, the fairy man in Dante Inferno or in the, in the Greek mythology. Yeah, bring, Chiron. And the Chiron. Yeah, yeah. In bringing our new generation from this place to the new, the new a new place. Yeah. And then let them create. We have to retire. In a way, we have to retire or continue taking them from one place, from this place of destruction to a place of possibilities. Yeah. I think that's what mm -hmm. we should be doing. And that's what I, I'm going to mentally be doing. Um, because I think that that's what we can do. We can finish destroying what needs to be destroyed, right? and pointing on the problems instead of allowing them for those problems that have created the, the, this destruction to be overlooked or forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then taking this new generation to a new place and allow them to, to create the new way of, a new way of life. And I hope that the core of our existence will change from the economy to a new humanism where we put the man and the woman at the center, where we put nature at the center. Yeah. Right? And I think that if this is the kind of energy that is a, the energy that artists can generate. Politicians are not gonna to destroy what, they're gonna to try to save what is, uh, what, um, what is still standing. Yeah. Right? Uh, because of uh, its, uh, its uh, jobs and its, uh, and its uh, the economy, its money. And I understand this is important, but there can be a different kind of economy and there can be definitely a different kind of a focus on, on in life where we, we, you know, I think Corey, myself, my mother, your mother cannot be sacrificed. Yeah. It's not yeah. even possible to think about that. 
not because they are our commanders, not yeah. because, but because it's unthinkable, should not be taught. So I think that, I'm sorry, this is my spiel that- uh, No, please, yeah. What I'm thinking, what I've been developing, because um, I don't want to go back to the old ways. I know that people have to eat. I know that people, that there are jobs. People, they have to go back to jobs and making money, and, and, but, and also the, the economy can change. There is, can be a transition into a new way where, you know, people are at the center. So well, I certainly think the big question that no one is prepared to pose in response to these people pushing for, you know, rapid reopening at the, you know, at whatever cost is, if you can no longer have two people sit in a park who just met and hold hands and have a first kiss without, you know, the fear that it may be the beginning of the end, if not for them, but for everyone that they care about and love. Like, how is, how is going back to work going to be in service to life? You know, like, we can open factories back up, we can send people back in there. And the idea that I get from what they're saying is, you know, if 50,000 have to die, 50,000 have to die, but the machine will keep going. But who buries those 50,000? And who mourns those 50,000? And what's the effect on the people who are mourning those 50,000? How does it infect, how does it in impact the way that they interact with everyone else in the world? You know, there is no, there's no short, there's no shortcut for that. And I do think that culturally, we're going to pay a huge, huge, huge price. We have been paying, but I think we'll pay a huge price um, to not experience what this moment is actually doing. Right. It's ripping threads out of the fabrics of people's lives and the people who survive it, you know, who survive it, they'll be damp like irreparable damage for the rest of their lives, which will ultimately impact the other people who are moving around in their communities, you know? And our, and our job, I think, is the artists, as you said, to show it, but to also not allow the media or the money men or whoever to bury it. If the shit stinks, people have to smell it. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, it doesn't help anybody. If we go around saying, well, the thing that you smell is not what you, you know, you smell. In New York, I'm, you know, heard, hearing those reports of uh, trucks full of bodies because there's no, you know, there's no room in the, you know, the morgues or the funeral homes to, to keep them. And the attempt to sort of hide those from people. I say, you're doing them more harm by hiding them than allowing them to see it. You know, that's reality. That's the truth. That's what the artist sees. Yeah. That's what the artist sees. Because uh, there are some things that are, attempt, the people uh, that, um, you know, who is in power attempts to hide, that can be hidden by people, the normal people. But we do, as artists, we do look at the reality a little bit differently. Mm. Uh, we can capture, uh, we can capture that. The difference, for instance, in, the, in, uh, in Italy, um, uh, we had the same problem, especially in the north of Italy. And so, and they used uh, army trucks to carry the bodies, mm. but they were not hidden in the sense we knew, we all saw mm. trucks going from from the host, wherever they got the bodies to a place of rest. And it was not hidden, it was uh, shown. This is what's happening. Let's mourn for these people. It was powerful. It was powerful. And here you tell me they're hiding it. Yeah. Kind of, uh, well, at any, at any moment, the conversation has to be changed. Like, you know, and, and not to give too much airtime <laughs> to the, the, the person who occupies the White House, but whether his attention span is so deficient that he can't, you know, 
navigate it or he's just not interested in, in, in discussing it at all. You cannot even get him to acknowledge the numbers of, of souls. You know, he can, he can utter the words of the, the actual number, but actually to identify, you know, to say a name, you know, to list a couple of names of people who have been sacrificed to this thing is incapable. They would rather just talk about jobs and talk about businesses opening and, you know, the stock market is coming back. And um, it's a very peculiar thing to witness. And I think it's probably the way that things have always been. But in this country, we're always inundated with other stimuli. We're always being told to go out and buy and, you know, shop and get this debt, and, you know, go watch this football game, go watch that baseball game, go buy this movie, you know, go watch the box, the big box office film. Um, anything to not think about what's actually happening in front of you. You know? Yeah. And how you get the artist who is, um, well, a number of artists who right now are just terrified. You know, the gig, the gig economy has been decimated and um, many theaters and, and artistic organizations around the country are, you know, freezing or holding in place, you know, canceling things going forward. So I am curious whether or not most of those people have the metal to continue creating in such adverse circumstances in the way that, you know, a previous generation of people, you know, may have embraced more, more fully. I don't know. I don't know. What about you? I am looking forward. I mean, I'm leaving. I'm going to probably leave here at the end of the month and go back to New York and, and, and uh, try to find a new normal there. So like, I, I threw in your phrase there, a new normal, a new abnormal. Um, but I'm hoping now that the teaching gig is, is kind of winding down to sort of step back into my artist shoes and like figure out what I want to, like what needs to be said, what needs to be said. Uh, and I'm looking forward to finding that out. I'm very much um, activated by the things that I'm seeing around me. I'm very much curious about, you know, how that expression is gonna take form. Um, my camera and, you know, iPhone, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about how technology can help create things in, a, in an environment where I can't gather with people that I would love to gather with in person and commiserate with. Um, but I'm figuring it out. And this, this conversation is doing a lot to get the wheels, get the wheels turning. Well, I appreciate that. But before we close, I am curious. I am a teacher, as you are. Mm. What were you thinking? Say that again. What, what were you teaching this semester? Ah, I was teaching a, a voice lab to BFA actors and a character analysis and scene study class. Um, yeah. And how did you teach those? Not being able to be with them. Yes, we had to do these changes, right? Yeah. Like, all we do theater is based on. Interact, real interaction, live interaction. Yes. But she's also part of our way of teaching. I don't know how you teach, but I have a sense that, you know, that you, the presence of the, the student is important. So I am interested in uh, knowing how you tackle that huge challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, little did I, I mean, I didn't know at the beginning of the semester, um, obviously, what was going to happen. But because I was coming into the school uh, at the second semester and I didn't have a, a relationship with the students prior, I actually front loaded the first half of my curriculum in both of those classes with very hands on physical Levon viewpoints, um, some Suzuki um, exercises in, in uh, that's where I'm looking for, um, inspired, there we are, by Jersey Grotowski. And so we were very, very, very physical those first, that first half of the semester. And when we broke, I had a sense that we might extend spring break, which they did by a week. And then we would come back to this virtual thing. And we hoped that by the end of the semester, we'd be back in person. So 
I had kind of set up the curriculum in a way for them to go away, spend some time reflecting um, and being a little bit more cerebral than I had allowed them to be in the first half of the semester while we were doing far more kinesthetic, more like um, just tactile in-person um, in person work. And I'm very thankful that I did that because the first thing that I noticed uh, when we came back is that their morales were like, all over the place you know i do a check-in every every class i'd ask them how they were feeling and some of them were trying to sort of smile and muscle through it two or three weeks in you could tell that the screens were exhausting them that they were you know many of them had gone back home to be with their families and so their personas had changed many of them were regressing you know while they were in school and learning on their own terms they were discovering who they were and who they wanted to be as artists and suddenly they were back in mom's house you know with sometimes siblings around sometimes you know they'd actually have space that they could use on their own sometimes not so i had to listen a lot more and i began to give them assignments that were far more abstract things that would keep them out of their heads because in isolation you know, away from your friends, away from, you know, <laughs> being stuck at home, like you're just stuck in your head. And some of the work that they managed to do, um, specifically in, my, in, the, in the voice class, just blew me away. I think they were forced to sit with themselves in a way that 19 or 20 year olds don't normally have to, because there's all the stimuli from social media and, you know, what have you otherwise. Um, I did show more video clips than I would have, you know, shown otherwise. But um, I tried to make as much use of technology as I could. I got them trying to figure out how they could use their phones as cameras, um, trying to readjust their relationship um, to being observed. Some of them are very self-conscious and suddenly I was asking them to document their, what would be very private practice, private process, have it documented with a camera. So um, I think we went into it in trying to embrace the limitations of the situation that we found, that we found ourselves in. And I was really, really heartened by uh, the work that we were able to put together by the end of the semester. What about you? Oh, I, I am on sabbatical. Ah. So that's why I was in Italy. And I was supposed to come back two days from today. So today's Wednesday, I was supposed to come back in Friday from Italy. So I was not teaching. I'm not teaching this semester. Um, so I don't know what I would have done. I know how difficult that has been for the professors, the teachers, and the students to adjust to this. And I am very in awe of all of you because I'm sure it was quite challenging. At least I, I will assume the first couple of lessons must have been like, oh my gosh, what do I do, all right? Well, because you're suddenly asked to do basically what a stage manager would do, especially if you're using a platform like Zoom, where you've got, I mean, one of my classes had 14 students and the other had 10. And when you're, you know, checking who's muted and who's not, and like people's internet connections are different, the camera qualities are different, how you actually can uh, curate the experience so everyone's experiencing in the same way is beyond me. But I'm hoping that in the time they have between now and the beginning of next semester, that they can figure out a way to sort of normalize it. Because um, it does, in a strange way, it sort of reveals. Um, the inequalities of people's situations. When you're in the laboratory in an acting class and you show up and you've got your lines learned and you've got your costume and we're all in that black box space, we're all the same. No, when you sign into a class from a Zoom, right? And the only space that you have is in your parents' kitchen and that refrigerator beeps the whole time and your friends or your classmates are able to peer into your life in that way, it creates a very different type of vulnerability, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. 
had a couple of students who only the only space they had was their backyard. And they had dogs and, you know, things in the back, you know, running around. And they sort of laughed it off and made a joke of it. But to see some of their classmates whose parents clearly lived very well, you know, uh, there was an effect on them, a very palpable, palpable effect. Well, yeah, yeah. That's quite it. Quite I think interesting, so I'm sure. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Hey, Roberto, thank, thank you. We did not have a chance to see each other in person for some time. Oh. Um, but, you know, keep in touch, please. Please. Uh, if you, I'm here, so we can always have a coffee together, even at a distance, and talk about old times. I'd love that. No, and new times. Please, let's do that. I'd love that. I, I, I thank you. I'm going to send you a link where this uh, video is going to be uh, shared in a drive. Uh, and then uh, we are going to use the video for any purpose that uh, can serve us. And it's going to be posted on uh, on social media. But you can also see my conversations with other artists from all over the world. I'd love that, yeah. With them artists. Uh, and um, for me, it's been illuminating, um, Corey. So I thank you very much for your time. And thank you. Please be in touch, OK? Please, I can't wait for us to collaborate again. I yeah. really did. You have to find a time in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Ciao, my friend. Here you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you.